Hey, how's it going guys? My name is Eelwood and today we're taking a look at Spellforce 3 Fallen God, a brand new standalone expansion of the Spellforce 3 series and to answer the ultimate question as always, is it worth your time? We should. So, Fallen God is a single slash multiplayer fantasy RTS RPG. Set in a medieval mythical world, you take on the role of a soon to be troll war chief, tasked with ensuring the survival of your severely weakened clan. You'll be taking revenge on the ruthless humanoid tusk hunters, making negotiations with a very mysterious stranger, all while travelling the world with your three trusted companions. So, aesthetically speaking, it's safe to say the game looks incredible. So incredible, in fact, I had to reduce the graphics quite a bit just to be able to record the game at full quality 60 FPS, which I really did not expect. It was the aesthetics alone that sold me on the idea to purchase the game in the first place. The actual gameplay I didn't take much notice of at first. I mean, let's be honest, if you're a fan of RPGs and RTSs, why wouldn't you want an overly luscious terrain, a sexy looking UI, and a primal themed army of trolls at your disposal because I jumped straight on it. To elaborate, the colours used are surprisingly diverse, they can be both rich and dynamic in areas yet quite pale and weathered in others. It purely depends on the combination of texture and lighting effects, which is a very good touch. Speaking of, the lighting effects I have to say are out of this world. There's plenty of ambient lighting, mist effects, sunbeams, flicker effects, under texture lighting, they've even got cloud lighting and about three different types of shadow effects, not to mention the effects produced from the many different character abilities throughout the game. Insanity. The textures are not far behind either. Overworld textures appear to be very natural, crude and incredibly realistic, great depth perception on the unusual troll structures and the piles and piles of foliage are practically perfect. The generally darker and underground areas have that moist, almost overglossed look to them, especially when interacting with the game's lighting which has also been pulled off very well. If you've got a machine that can handle this game on maximum settings, you're gonna be in a world of bliss, let me tell you. The UI as mentioned is indeed sexy, just enough required information and a nice well bordered arrangement on screen. Some would say it lacks the more common UI animations as seen in other RTSs, but due to the simple design I didn't find a problem with them. Other screens like inventory, merchant and ability wheels are also very nice and pretty easy to understand. The ability tree however can seem a bit like a storyboard in terms of ability descriptions and talent layout which is true at first, but once you've had a few minutes to scan over the abilities and stat descriptions, it's not so bad. Level layouts are very nice, you have your classic huge RTS areas for base building and assaults, with the addition of some cosy corridor zones where the base building mechanics are disabled to mix up the gameplay a bit. Ground clutter can vary depending on the area and base building zones can get quite crammed, but since you play as a generally unorganised race of trolls, I'm sure you can let that slide. Character and enemy designs are pretty decent all troll variants are either big and bulky or slim and nimble. You do get the occasional absolutely huge troll characters, but I wouldn't have expected anything less. The animation quality, relative physics and model designs are all very nice and thankfully don't go down the route of overly energetic, arms flailing dramatic trolls, which if you're a 7 to 12 foot creature is very unlikely anyway. Other characters like enemy humanoids and your more mythical creatures are also quite good. If I were to nitpick, the high up airborne unit models are definitely not the best I've ever seen, but luckily seem to get the job done fine. Overall an incredibly high visual quality that if your hardware can handle will be an experience you definitely won't forget. The OSTs in Fallen God are not bad actually. Fully orchestrated soundtracks with pretty powerful drum beats, drawn out instrumental sounds and deep male vocals create your classic warband style soundtracks that suit the troll themed gameplay well. Unfortunately when you've heard one of their classic war themed soundtracks you've pretty much heard them all. They unfortunately didn't push the boat out in terms of creativity which has resulted in quite predictable, slightly tedious tracks, however there are quite a few tracks that are actually very good and have at least some kind of 
memorable main melody, especially on the gentler, less warlike tracks. But a lot of them are so similar in style and composition, it's a bit of a shame really. Thankfully though, what seems to have saved them is their impressive sound effects, ambient sounds and troll style voice acting, both of which are brilliant quality and definitely add to the gameplay experience. The environmental sounds of blazing braziers, greenland wildlife and more are just right and really demonstrate an ambience of nature. The voice acting is just as good quality with its deep male voice actors, impressive demonstration of emotion and your standard broken troll speech. The only downside for me was the amount of dialogue. It was fine during gameplay quotes but during cutscenes never have I seen a broken speech race of trolls talk so much in a game. For the first 20 minutes of gameplay it was quite interesting and gripping. After that point I literally skipped all dialogue cutscenes throughout my whole playthrough because they felt like they went on forever. Surely the purpose of a broken speech race is to get to the point in conversations. But who knows, I'm not a troll expert. Overall, a decent soundtrack standard that combines pretty well with the voice acting and ambience. Now for the gameplay. So firstly, Fallen God does indeed have a few difficulty options to choose from before you play. You can choose between Easy, Normal, Hard and Circle Mage mode. The difference between each mode is basically enemy damage dealt and base HP increases as far as I could tell, but for my personal playthrough I played on Normal mode only, which to be fair was a decent challenge that did require some form of equipment optimization and character relocation. I don't even want to think about Circle Mage mode, but I do commend anyone with the balls to actually complete it. The lore of the game is somewhat interesting. As mentioned, you play as a soon-to-be troll war chief of the Moonkin tribe, burdened by the waning fate of your entire clan due to both the infamous Tusk Hunters and a crippling disease. Throughout your travels, you stumble across a mysterious stranger that offers your clan salvation in return for assisting in the resurrection of a fallen god. I would elaborate further and spoil the game for you all, but honestly, after the introduction, I didn't pay attention to the lore whatsoever. Whatsoever. I watched the dialogue scenes up to meeting the stranger for the first time, but from that point on I skipped literally every single dialogue box I could see because as I said, the dialogue was so long winded and gets very boring very quickly. A real big shame since the voice acting is brilliant, but what can you do? When you first start the game you're brought straight to a character customization screen. You know when I said earlier you'd be travelling the world with your three trusted troll companions? Well this is where you actually get to customise them in terms of light visual changes, starting attributes and selecting a class for each that you won't be able to change later on. From what I gathered, attributes are mainly to hit specific attribute requirements on equipment and also improving your relevant stats. When selecting your classes though, I would definitely recommend putting some serious thought into it as all four characters will be travelling together pretty much all of the time, so you at least want some sort of synergy going on. I personally made the War Chief a warrior tank, I made Gragua a kind of druid character, Zaska was somewhat a necromancer and Noag is a powerful melee by default which you can't change anyway. Each class has its own skill tree which you can assign yourself abilities and passives from with points you obtain from level ups. The trees as mentioned are quite daunting to read through at first but after a while you'll get used to them. So once you've selected your difficulty and your team setup, you watch a short intro cutscene to introduce you to the game's plot, take control of your characters and play. If you're somewhat familiar with the Warcraft RTS series, you'll feel right at home with this game's base concept. You control a main character, or four in this case, walk around large maps, complete quests, build bases, gather resources, train up troops and crush your enemies. Or at least that's the bare bone description anyway. You'll also notice that each stage will consist of three possible base objectives. Sometimes you roam around with only your four characters, sometimes you'll mount full scale base building carnage, or a combination of the both which to be honest is a very good formula that definitely mixes up the gaming experience. There is often a lot more to it than that of course, but just to give you the rundown. To elaborate a bit, the base building concept is identical to other RTSs. Creating any kind of asset like buildings or troops requires a set amount of resources such as bricks, wood or metal. Resources are gathered by assigning troops to resource gathering buildings, which auto carry the chosen resource from an available location back to the building. Each mission you'll begin with just enough resources to start you off with your first buildings, but it's up to you to sustain your resources correctly. Same principle with generating troops. Build unit producing buildings, 
pay mainly food as a resource to create them, then after a few seconds they'll spawn next to that building. I really didn't like the training mechanic for combat troops though. Once your combat troop is generated, you need to send them to a completely different training building for a period of time, so they'll then pop out again as an improved unit. Such a waste of time and space, which they could have built into the original production buildings. I found the troops to be quite boring as well. No special abilities to speak of, not even a passive to tempt you with a specific unit. Shame really. When it comes to your four troll heroes, other than your selected abilities and passives, they also benefit from character specific abilities. These include Grungwag's decipher ability, Noag's troll smash ability and Zaska's dig ability, each of which can be used to uncover packets of lore, assist with side quests and to advance the main story. You also have access to a variety of shops and vendors around the world that sell various items which you can purchase using scavenge currencies and generating resources from a disenchant system, which I'm sure we're all familiar with. This also means that each character has access to a full equipment screen that includes armor, weapons, trinkets and rings, which was a pleasant surprise. Trinkets can also provide an additional ability that can be activated during combat and most weapons will provide some sort of gentle passive as well, which was nice. The actual combat experience of Fallen God was not bad. As you start to level up your team, you'll be gaining and spending ability points. This will slowly net you new abilities and passives that provide a wide range of advantages in combat. You can assign unlocked abilities to your action bar at the top of the screen, which can be activated through the F keys. Or better yet, holding the Alt key slows down time and presents you with a combat wheel that you can select your abilities from. Every ability can also include status effects like poisons or bleed, stun effects, slow effects, and also some out of the box stuff like corpse draining and holding your ground. Thankfully, each ability has a border color specific to each character, so you know whose ability is whose, which surprisingly helped me a lot. The only problem is the absolutely insane amount of character and equipment abilities you're expected to manage in one tiny action bar. It's quite literally impossible. Yes, okay, they do supply a second action bar to use, but who wants to be switching between action bars just to use a fucking ability? Definitely not me. The generated units you get through base building felt very out of place when considering your main characters. Most of the time I just used them as cannon fodder while my four units were my main damage dealers and stayed safe. I admit, some units like the wall breakers were definitely useful, but compared to other RTSs, the units just felt slapped together last minute, which was yet another shame. A lot of the time, I felt I had way more fun during the four character only missions, where you would have to explore smaller, more narrow areas without the assistance of your bases, which for an RTS is not good. Overall, quite a mediocre base building experience that is luckily outshined by its somewhat decent quad protagonist gameplay. So for the ultimate question, is it worth your time? The overall production quality is definitely there, but due to its poor execution and composition, the immersion is very short-lived and the player satisfaction diminishes just as quickly. I'm going to give this game a NO CONTEST. I played this game for around 7 hours total. The first 2 hours I have to say were fine. The tutorial, learning your character abilities, getting to grips with the base mechanics were all pretty good, but the further you progressed, the more you you leveled up and the more you advanced the story, I slowly came to the realization that damn, this is becoming a real chore to play. The dialogue scenes were so long and boring, I had to skip pretty much all of them after the introduction. The increase in character skills became a pain because of the puny little action bar you're expected to manage. Just the idea of a secondary action bar is annoying. No one actually enjoys swapping action bars no matter what game you play. All combat units feel completely out of place and don't provide any obvious utility or variety to the gameplay in the form of a passive or ability. The base building mechanics were quite dull, with the two training huts being two completely pointless buildings that should have been combined with the original unit production building. The game really tries to twist your arm into signing up with an email address for online play, which again, no one likes. The four main characters are basically forced to stick together pretty much 24-7, since specific characters have to interact with each other, loot objects and progress certain objectives. But the straw that really broke the camel's back for me was this particular progression quest. When you have to skip reams of dialogue just to get back into the gameplay and are then presented with a percentage objective main quest with no actual guidance on what to do next, you are indeed fucking stuck.
work. After a while, I managed to figure out that you gain percentage from completing side quests, which the name side quest is supposed to imply an optional task and not a fucking mandatory one. I went up to 15% progression after completing one happy days, but then dropped back down to 0% when completing another side quest. Whether it was intentional or a bug, I just could not be asked. The game was slowly becoming a chore to play as it was without the stupid main quest progression getting in the way. I wouldn't be surprised if some of you have a better experience than I did following any potential updates and patches, but as of right now, due to the points mentioned, I definitely wouldn't recommend it. Well guys, I hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, leave a like. Subscribe if you want to see more games I'm supposed to be reviewing each week. It's been a while since I made a review on the channel. It's a shame we've come back to quite a negative one, but as I've said in other videos, I'm not here to blow sunshine up your ass. I'm here to tell you how it is. Also, I've recently completed my quite late 500 sub special live stream if anyone's interested. I've also created a Twitch channel to keep my stream separate from my reviews. If anyone's interested in that sort of thing, the links are in the description. But as always guys, all the best, take care.